for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. When you actually look at the direct evidence, for example, um, molecular clocks, like what are your thoughts on the, I mean, I know you've heard me speak of it before. What like if we go as close to home as possible, for example, let's look at humans and we look at observed uh, mitochondrial DNA mutation rates, just looking at the observed mutation rate, you know, not making up hypothetical mutation rates in the past and fitting them with, uh, you know, calibrating them with the fossil record. Um, cause the, 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 the point in question is the deep time because everything you're looking at and, um, the so-called transitions you're looking at in the fossil record that is, that assumes deep time evolution. But I'm saying that the number of species today on the planet don't reflect deep time, deep time evolution. Um, therefore, that's the point in question. So we just want to look at the mutation rates today, not only in the mitochondrial DNA, but also in the Y chromosome. Why do those only take humans back, uh, both in the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome? Because this is what I find to be fascinating evidence. Why does um, why do those numbers? the number of DNA differences, let's just start with the mitochondrial DNA. Why does that only take us back to a mitochondrial Eve roughly um, 6,000 years ago? Uh, go ahead, Snake, take your time. Uh, well, it's, I mean, estimates range from like 200,000 to like 7,000. Um, well, the 200. And that's that's just well, going go ahead, back, sorry. that's just going back to a common ancestor. So we don't really, we can't really use those clocks to determine the actual age of them, just like when they split. Well, I'm not, I'm not referring to, yeah, like your, your 200,000 year dates for the, um, for the mitochondrial leave that are derived. That's because they take the dates from the secular papers. So the observed, like, for example, the Parsons paper, you know, that um, was adopted by the FBI. It's so good. It's so consistent, which takes Eve back 6,000 years. But when you read the details of the paper, they assume evolution. So yeah, they'll calibrate it with the fossil record and conclude that Eve, uh, the mother of all living, um, the last um, mitochondrial DNA common ancestor was 200,000 years ago. But remember, that's based on the um, fossil record. That's based on geology and phylogeny based assumptions. But remember here, if we're, if we're looking to the models um, and we're looking at the differenti differentiating evidence, I would be questioning the deep time uh, paradigm, the deep time assumption. So I'm not going to assume the deep time um, evolutionary model when looking at these observed mutation rates. So when we actually look at the actual empirically observed mutation rate for, let's say, mitochondrial DNA, well, that always takes her back just thousands of, of years ago. So yeah, I, I understand what you're saying about the 200,000 years ago, but that's only when they calibrate it with the fossil record. So just stick to like your pedigree-based studies. You know, why is that not compelling to you? And take your time, Snake, whatever you have to say. Well, I did also want to get you uh, to send me those studies so I could read it because I can't quite find what you're talking about. But um, of course, I, I, I could sh screen share them right now, if, but I mean, we can't read them on the spot. So I, it might just be better for me to um, send them to you and, and you could you, yeah, have, you read, think, have you read um, the Parsons paper at least. Uh, I don't I don't think so. OK, no, and that's fine. Um, but. I mean, there's a lot of things, mitochondria, well, there, there's a different differentiation in mutation rate as well. Right. We know that sometimes mutation rates are high, sometimes they're lower. Um, they're, that's about all I can consistent. Say. They're consistent um, for the most part, right? And, and there's certain things like... Um, heteroplasmy and there's certain things that need the population histories, population sizes that need to be considered. Um, but that's why I always say that um, the deciding factor as to which model is strongest is going to come down to who's making better testable prediction. I'm taking the challenge to them now and saying, hey, Let's go out and there's a, there's a fox in the woods. I bet you I can tell you how fast his mutation rate is. So I understand with what you're saying that if you assume deep time evolution, you have to calibrate those observed numbers from pedigree-based studies with the fossil record, okay, to come up with 
um, to come up with the evolutionary Eve date. But like I said before, you know, that's the, that's the point in question. So evolutionists can say, Hey, listen, in the past, mutation rates in the mitochondrial DNA were significantly slower because some of them actually say like between 10 and 30 times slower. But here's the thing, who's making the best testable predictions? And then you're not new to this snake. You know that Dr. Jensen has taken the observed mutation rates in mitochondrial DNA in non-African people groups. And he's saying, okay, this is how confident I am with the Eve date of 6,000 years. He's looked at some African tribes where their mutation rate has not yet been measured. And he's made a, a future testable prediction as to how fast or how quickly their DNA changes or mutates in the mitochondrial DNA. And that's a prediction on print. So in order for an explanation to be scientific and not just post hoc, ad hoc or rescue device or non-science, for example, testable predictions have to flow. They have to flow from that explanations. Therefore, I mean, are you aware of any evolutionists that are making mitochondrial DNA predictions on people groups? Let's say some of these African tribes like the Khoisan peoples whose mutation rate has not yet been measured. Well, I need, I do need to read those uh, papers from Jensen. Like I've read some of his papers, like the synergistic epistasis I found, a couple other ones I found, but I can't, I can't find what you're talking about with. Well, I think that's the mitochondrial stuff. I think the synergistic is um, Dr. Sanford in regards to genetic. Oh yeah, it was, it was Sanford. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and that's fine, and that's fine. We can. Um, we can talk about that as well. But when it comes to molecular clocks, that's why he's saying, hey, I, you can point me to some fox in the woods or you can point me to some animal species and I will tell you, I will predict how quickly that animal mutates. You know, he's, he's, he's going on the offense and he's making these predictions because he's, we are all, we're questioning the, um, the fossil record, the deep time um, claimed evolutionary history and these just observed mutation rates. And we can even look to the, um, the Y chromosome, but real quick on the mitochondrial DNA, I found it funny that, and you can look at these papers before, of course, not only until after the um, shock of, of the evolutionary community as to, as to the amount of mitochondrial DNA differences that exist, did they actually look to um, coalescence to explain all these um, differences? So they're invoking um, coalescence as a post hoc evolutionary explanation to explain away the data. But, and, and if you put yourself in, in the mindset of a young earth creationist, if just, if just basic observed mutation rates in the mitochondrial DNA, just take the Eve date back to 6,000 years, which is exactly what the dates add up to in the Bible, why would we then take those dates and those numbers and calibrate them with the fossil record? Like that's, um, you know, that, that wouldn't make any sense. No, it's, it, it makes better sense to now make more testable predictions, which Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has, um, has done. And even in his debate with Dr. Vanima, who's an evolutionary biologist, he even, um, he even kind of praised Jensen for that. He said, that's, that's a good prediction to make, you know, and he admitted he can't make it because, um, according to deep time evolution, there's so many different factors, so many different historical demographics, so many different population histories that it's difficult, but, it's not impossible. All the evolutionists would have to do is predict how fast, or no, the, the evolutionists would have to predict, you know, when does the mutation rate slow down? When does it accelerate? Look at a certain population where the mutation rate hasn't been measured. Like this is entirely possible, but the question is why aren't they, why aren't they doing it? And I, I know I talked a lot there, but that the reason why is because molecular clocks really are. Um, we, we can trace back the history of humanity in our DNA, the clock ticks from generation to generation. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. What, what, what are your thoughts on that, uh, Snake? Well, yeah, I mean, I wanted to read the stuff by Jensen before I comment too much on it. Um, but again, we we know that like there are multiple animals that have widely different mutation rates, and different parts of the genome mutate more often than other parts of the genome. Uh, things like that. Uh, well, I believe other, I believe like other animals were calculated to be much older than the six or 7,000 year old pedigree for humans using the same methods. Um, and I wanted to get 
more into genetics a little later on. I still have a couple of uh, of course, of course, like more follow up well, questions. Hey, let me just let, let me just make one last comment on that real quick, because for the most part, because I have a paper here that suggests that it, mammals, mammal wise, most mutation rates are pretty well consistent. Now, I don't want to say constant because, yeah, they can fluctuate a little bit, but they're consistent. They're not 10 to 30 times slower in the past like the evolutionists say. Mitochondrial DNA, for example, uh, ticks fast. These, these clocks are fast universally among all species. Now, here's the thing that's different. Generation times. That's why Jensen will look at the generation time, right? He can look at other factors as well, and that's where these... Um, they could look, for example, the Khoisan peoples, like some of the African people groups, uh, their generation times um, seem to have been a lot different in the past. Therefore, that would reflect a, a slightly faster mutation rate. And that's why he's making a prediction to test whether or not that's true. And then, and before you get to that question, I do, we can, we can end it there on the mitochondrial DNA until you study that a little further. I'll send that to you. But are you then familiar with the Y chromosome now with these papers that are suggesting that it uh, mutates, it, it ticks faster than was ever expected. And now those, what are those Y chromosome differences, as fascinating as it is, only goes back just about 4,500 years. And we know exactly what happened 4,500 years. That was, um, that was Noah. He would be our last Y chromosomal common common ancestor. And, and those sequences found in the Y chromosome are nothing like the sequences found in the chimpanzee Y chromosome. The chimpanzee Y chromosome and human Y chromosome are like 70%. And there's some size difference as well. So it's less than 70% similar. So if our closest common ancestor is the chimpanzee, why is it nothing, nothing like the human Y chromosome? But the human Y chromosome, boom, goes back just um, 4,500 years. And Dr. Jensen said, okay, if this is true, there must be genetic signatures and markers in our Y chromosome, genetic stamps that can give us clues into the history of humanity. And boom, he's got like a 25 part series, highly technical. I, I can send that to you as well, where he's discovering all of these genetic signatures, migration patterns, um, things that should not be found if deep time evolution was true. Because remember the last 4,500 years, according to deep time evolution and the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA, that's just like the, the, the end, the tip of a needle of a long, long history. Those signatures shouldn't be there. It should just be a scrambled mess. So that's what I mean by genetics. You know, genetics is really, really, um, in my opinion, winning the war for, um, for creations. Of course, you can comment on anything that I just said there, Snake. And then if you'd like to just move on to another question you had, I think regarding the fossil record, go ahead, go ahead, take your time. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm more familiar with the Y chromosome stuff and I, I've read a few things on uh, uh, pedigree based mitochondrial mutation rates and uh, but I, I really wanted to to read the Jensen stuff first um, what about before that? I make a final comment on that. But as for like, chromosome, Y chromosome, yeah, it is it is more unstable, and uh, right. uh, there's a bunch of research. Well, first of all, like if it wasn't unstable, then we wouldn't we would expect that to be the least common between the chimps and the humans. And then secondly, there is uh, research on I think mole rats uh, or some kind of rodent that is basically their y chromosome is degraded almost completely and what's happening is they're forming a different a new chromosome is that so, is that in the lab that one uh that's that's just observing the the uh, genetics of the actual animals in in those animals like what was it that degraded to near extinction a mouse you said no, the Y chromosome in the, I think it was like a mole rat or something like that. Okay, like this was in the wild or was it like in a lab experiment? It's just measuring wild ones. Wild ones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the point so, is with, with what they're finding is the Y chromosome does mutate a lot faster because the thing is evolutionists used to point, like there's one guy, Evo Grad, Rational Mind, he said, uh, regarding replacing Darwin, he says it's like Jensen just ignores the Y chromosome. You know, he says nothing about it because the amount of DNA differences in the Y chromosome disproves young Earth creation. He says, but based on you know some of the newest studies and um, high quality Y chromosomal uh, DNA sequences, 
it's it's now known that the Y chromosome changes a lot faster than we thought. Therefore, um, the results, and Dr. Jensen's put out uh, recently a, a study, a peer-reviewed study in AIG, which I know you wouldn't agree with, but I'll send it to you anyway to see what your thoughts are. He, he demonstrated that the amount of DNA differences in the Y chromosome that exist in humans are only about 4,500 years worth of mutation accumulation. Now, here's the thing. If evolution was true, um, now we do know that Y chromosome is, I wouldn't say it's entirely the most unstable because it is for the most part immune to recombination, right? Because it doesn't have a counterpart to exchange its genetic material with. Therefore, scrambling purposes, it's, it's stable in a way where we should be able to look at the sequences themselves and look at um, markers, genetic markers, for example, which is what Jensen's doing, and seeing if he can detect historical signatures in, in the Y chromosome, which is which is what he's doing. So in in, in that case, it's 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 stable. It's it's immune to recombination. But according to the evolutionary model, if humans and chimps split nearly six million years ago, let's say, they would have had identical Y chromosomes at the split. Now let's say the chimp line, okay, their Y chromosome was mutating fast the human Y chromosome was mutating fast. Now we're here six million years later. So why was the chimp, um, the patterns and the um, history, population history of chimps so much different to humans that it still resulted in a um, Y chromosomal sequence difference of like less than 70% because that would have to be some really, really significantly different environmental histories, wouldn't you say? Of course, humans would have been in a much different environment than chimps. They would have a uh, much different uh, selection pressures. And we'd, if there's a small difference in just 4,500 years, then there's going to be a large difference in 6 million years. Um. Here, here's the thing, though, for that explanation to be like, I've heard that um, I think it was Rational Mind himself that said, you know, why chromosome um, differences could be explained by uh, faster rates of gene conversion. But remember, you, you know what I'm going to say? What testable predictions can you make then? Right. What type of histories? What type of environmental conditions? When did the Y chromosome decay faster? When did you know? When was it a little bit more stable? For example, I mean, anybody can just come up with these post hoc ad hoc rescue devices and, and stories and stuff, right? And and you would agree, you know, you don't want to hear about what I believe. You want to hear about what's demonstrable, what's observable, what's testable, and that's why I'm saying, hey, listen, this is what the pedigree based studies indicate. Here's the predictions that flow from it. It. evolutionists they're kind of on the defense when it comes to molecular clocks they're you know they're given reasons they're giving um, stories and rescue devices as far as I'm concerned but without the testable predictions to flow from from those explanations they're just they're just non-science <laughs>